When most of us think about the moon landing, we picture July 1969. Neil Armstrong stepping onto the lunar surface and saying those famous words. But what often gets overlooked is that Apollo wasn't just one mission. NASA sent astronauts to the moon six times between 1969 and 1972. Six successful landings in only three years. That's a pace almost impossible to imagine today, considering we haven't been back in more than half a century. Apollo 11 was the first, of course, but the rest of the program built on that achievement, expanding our scientific understanding of the moon. By the time Apollo ended, astronauts had not only walked on the lunar surface, but also driven across it, drilled into it, and brought back over 380 kilograms of rock and soil. Apollo 12 came just four months after Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin made history. If Apollo 11 had been about proving it was possible, Apollo 12 was about showing precision. NASA wanted to prove they could land exactly where they aimed, not just somewhere nearby. Their target was the site of Surveyor 3, an unmanned probe that had landed on the moon back in 1967. But the mission almost ended before it began. Just 36 seconds after liftoff, lightning struck the Saturn V rocket. Not once, but twice. The power surge knocked out the spacecraft's fuel cells and guidance system. For a moment, it looked like the mission might be lost. But flight controllers restored the systems. From there, things went almost perfectly. The lunar module landed just 160 meters away from Surveyor 3, and astronauts Pete Conrad and Alan Bean actually walked over to it. They even removed pieces of the old probe and brought them back to Earth, so scientists could study how years of exposure to lunar conditions had affected it. Apollo 13 was supposed to be the third lunar landing, but instead, it became the most famous, successful failure in spaceflight history. About 56 hours into the mission, one of the spacecraft's oxygen tanks exploded. The command module quickly lost power and life support, forcing the astronauts to retreat into the lunar module as a kind of lifeboat. Suddenly, getting to the moon didn't matter anymore. Survival was the only goal. For days, the world watched as NASA engineers scrambled to improvise solutions. One of the most famous challenges was building a carbon dioxide filter from spare parts on board, literally duct tape, plastic bags, and hoses. Against all odds, the crew made it safely back to Earth. Apollo 13 reminded everyone just how dangerous these missions were and showed the value of preparation, teamwork, and quick thinking under pressure. Apollo 14 picked up where 13 had left off. The commander was Alan Shepard, already a legend as the first American in space. But this mission wasn't easy either. The docking mechanism between the command module and lunar module malfunctioned, preventing them from connecting. After multiple attempts, Shepard managed to slam the spacecrafts together hard enough to lock them in place. On the surface, Shepard and Edgar Mitchell conducted scientific experiments and collected samples. But Shepard also had a little fun. He had secretly brought a makeshift golf club head, attached it to a handle, and hit two golf balls on the moon. With one hand in a bulky spacesuit, his swing wasn't perfect, but one of the balls traveled miles and miles, at least according to Shepard. It was a lighthearted moment in an otherwise serious mission, and it became one of the most iconic stunts in space history. Apollo 15 was a turning point. Up until then, lunar missions had been fairly short, usually just a couple of days. But Apollo 15 introduced what NASA called the J mission, with longer stays, more advanced experiments, and most importantly, the lunar rover. This electric vehicle gave astronauts David Scott and James Irwin the ability to explore areas several kilometers away from the landing site. For the first time, humans could cover real distance on the lunar surface. They visited Hadley Rill, a massive channel thought to have been formed by ancient volcanic activity, and the Apennine Mountains, some of the most rugged terrain on the moon. The astronauts also conducted one of the most famous demonstrations of physics, dropping a hammer and a feather at the same time. With no air resistance, both objects fell at the same rate, 
hitting the ground together. It was Galileo's theory proven in front of the world on another celestial body. Apollo 16 took exploration to the lunar highlands, a region geologists had long debated. Some thought the landscape was formed by volcanic activity, while others suspected giant asteroid impacts. Astronauts John Young and Charles Duke spent three days on the surface, driving their rover more than 26 kilometers and collecting nearly 100 kilograms of rocks. Their samples showed that the highlands weren't volcanic, but instead were shaped by ancient impacts. The mission also revealed just how problematic lunar dust could be. The fine, sharp-edged particles clung to everything, suits, tools, even the inside of the spacecraft, and it was nearly impossible to get rid of. Duke later said it smelled like burnt gunpowder, though scientists still debate exactly what caused that odor. Apollo 17 in December 1972 was the last mission, and NASA made sure it was the most ambitious. This time, one of the crew members wasn't just a pilot or engineer. Harrison Schmidt was a professional geologist, making him the only trained scientist ever to walk on the moon. Alongside Commander Gene Cernan, he explored the Taurus Litro Valley, a region chosen because it combined mountainous terrain with a deep valley floor. The astronauts set distance records with their rover, traveled more than 35 kilometers, and collected over 110 kilograms of samples. One of the most surprising discoveries came when Schmidt spotted patches of orange soil. At first glance, it looked almost like rust, but later analysis showed it was made of volcanic glass beads, evidence of ancient explosive eruptions on the moon. As the mission came to a close, Cernan left the final human footprints on the lunar surface. His parting words spoke of leaving with peace and hope for all mankind. And just like that, Apollo was over. Six landings, 12 men who walked on the moon, and a total of 842 pounds of lunar material brought back to Earth. The program had cost billions of dollars and carried immense risks, but it gave us discoveries that scientists are still studying today. It showed what was possible when engineering, science, and sheer determination came together. Since Apollo 17 in 1972, no human has returned to the moon. That's more than 50 years, and it makes people wonder how we managed to do it back then with such limited technology, but can't seem to repeat it today. The computers used in the Apollo missions were weaker than the phone in your pocket, yet astronauts were able to fly to the moon, land, and come back safely. Because of this long gap, some people even believe the moon landings were fake. They ask, if we really went, why haven't we gone back? That's why conspiracy theories became so popular. The truth is, Apollo was real, but it was also extremely expensive and risky. The United States only pushed so hard to get to the moon because of the Cold War and the race with the Soviet Union. Once they achieved the goal, the funding and motivation quickly faded away. Without that same political pressure, it was hard to justify spending billions on going back. What made Apollo possible was not just technology, but the effort of over 400,000 people, all working together with one clear goal. Today, we have better technology, but we don't always have that same focus or urgency. If you want to see more videos about space and the latest updates on rockets, missions, and discoveries, make sure to subscribe to our channel.